Welcome to Oregon Cash Flow Pro. My name is James Barber, and I'm always here to help you maximize your cash flow. Today's video is going to be a easy to understand guide to using the cash value inside your life insurance. So we're gonna call this the easy guide to life insurance loans. Now I put this information out here, not as necessarily a definitive guide. We're not gonna necessarily cover everything you need to know about policy loans for your insurance policy. There's so many different insurance policies and each carrier has different loan options. But this is going to basically give you a framework for how we think about these things. I would urge you to reach out to your agent if you have any particular questions about your policy and perhaps a specific plan on how to access those cash values before retirement or after retirement. In general, there's not really a difference before retirement or after retirement except for how I like to treat the cash value inside of these policies. We usually have a different plan. We're gonna use the cash value before retirement, like a line of credit, and we're gonna use the cash value after retirement to help supplement our retirement efforts, or we're just gonna leave it for our beneficiaries. So check with your agent when it comes to coming up with a plan for how to access the cash value efficiently throughout retirement, but we're gonna talk numbers here and we're gonna go over quickly the different ways to think about our cash value and our life insurance, depending on what type of loans we have available to us. First, let's talk about policy loans pre-retirement. What I like to do is utilize participating index loans if they're available. Participating index loans are something that's available with an indexed universal life policy. It's a way that we can access the cash values without impacting the growth whole life is going to be treated differently. Whole life, we essentially just have access to wash loans. We're going to pay a certain amount and we're going to get an offsetting credit. And that offsetting credit may or may not quite cover the expense of the loan, but it mostly washes. Wash loans are also available inside of an index universal life policy. But pre-retirement, we're going to assume that the indexes that we're using have the opportunity to grow at greater than a 5% interest. And most of all, most of our policies, we're gonna be able to borrow without impacting that growth at right around 5%. Some policies might be lower, some might be locked in at five forever, and some might be able to go a little bit higher than 5%. But the key is, whenever we wanna access the cash value, we don't wanna impact the underlying growth. We don't wanna minimize that underlying growth. and we should be able to get some arbitrage inside the IUL policies anyways, if we have access to some good index options and the market's doing well. That is why we own those policies and what we expect from them. Now, if you're in a policy where you know you're not gonna be getting arbitrage, we're gonna probably just use a wash loan. So this is one of those instances where, if you're not sure, check with your agent. They should be, help, they should be able to help you understand what might be best for your situation and which type of policy you own. The types of policies we like to sell, we like to have the opportunity to have a participating index loan against indexes that have historically performed well above the 5% and we're not paying more than 5% to borrow out of these things. How we treat those loans, how, or rather how we treat the cash value inside of our policies. We wanna treat that cash value just like any other line of credit that you own. This is a line of credit that we have access to at 5%. You're going to consider anytime you need to use money, anytime you have to buy an asset or make a purchase, where do you get the money from? If you're sitting on cash, you're probably going to use the cash. If you need to borrow it, do you use a credit card? Do you use a line of credit from your bank? Do you use a home equity line of credit? Or do we use the cash value from our life insurance? This is just another option among all of those different options. I try not to think about it any differently. And if we're using the participating index loan, I don't even have to consider how it affects the growth in my policy. If I, if I need to use a wash loan, then I'm gonna also consider if I borrow from the life insurance, how it's gonna affect the growth in my policy compared to if I was able to just use something else. Case in point, and I'm not gonna belabor this topic, but if I have to use a wash loan, and let's say I'm borrowing at 2% and I get an offsetting credit of 2%, I'm gonna limit the growth in my policy to 2% for those collateralized funds. Now. The index, I might be averaging six, seven, eight percent in the policy up to that point. And so we can assume that I'm essentially missing out on 
four, five, six percent of growth if I use that wash loan instead of a participating index loan. So I'm going to have to factor that in to what is the cost if I use a different funding option. If I could borrow from a HELOC at six percent, that might be a better option because I still get the potential growth. But realistically, <laughs> I could borrow with the participating index loan at five percent. So I'm probably not going to consider a home equity line of credit at six percent. Now we treat it just like any other line of credit. We're going to pay it back. And we know that when we pay it back, it's available to borrow again. This is often what we refer to as our infinite bank. Doesn't matter whether I'm borrowing from whole life or an IUL. We can use them both like an infinite bank where we access the cash, just like a line of credit. We put it back. It's available to borrow again. This is just a line of credit that we're building up over time. So that's how we like to think about it. The main thing to consider is don't borrow too much and risk a policy lapse. If you're ever borrowing almost all of the cash value out of the policy, you need to make sure that you can afford to cover the loan interest. How I like to treat my policies is I don't care so much how much I'm borrowing out of it as long as I can cover the interest. If I can cover the interest each year, my policy will not lapse. Now, I don't borrow frivolously out of it. We have a purpose to borrow from it and we have a plan to pay it back. But I'm not concerned if I borrow the maximum cash value out of it, if it's for a good reason, and I know I can at least cover the interest. If I get to the policy anniversary and I can't cover that interest, my policy can lapse. So you need to make sure that you don't put yourself in that position. This is often why I like to talk about storing our emergency funds inside of our policies so that we don't get that close. We don't want to get it that close to the edge where we're risking a policy lapse. Things get complicated when it gets to that point. And the worst thing that can happen to you is you borrow too much, your policy lapses, and not only do you no longer have this policy available to you, but you're gonna get a bill from the government for any gains in it. You gotta pay income tax on any gains that you have in that policy. So that's the worst case scenario. We don't want that to happen. There are ways to avoid that in some policies when we get into retirement. That's the overloan protection rider, and we'll address that here in a little bit. So that's your policy loans pre-retirement. Let's move into retirement. When we get into retirement, there's still two types of loans that we have to consider. And depending on what we have available to us, we might use one or the other when we first start in retirement. If we just have a wash loan, this is a loan where you're gonna pay an amount and you're gonna get an offsetting credit that's equal to or close to that amount but there's still gonna be expenses inside the policy. So there will most likely be a net cost either way in the policy each year, but that net cost should be very low. So if we're using a wash loan in retirement, and this wash loan is essentially like your direct recognition policies in whole life. When you have a wash loan, we're gonna withdraw up to the basis. The, the basis is the amount of money you've paid into the policy. So we're gonna withdraw up to the basis and then borrow. It's pretty simple to understand. Now I'm gonna show you why we borrow once we've gotten to the basis. But before I get to that point, we're gonna talk about the other type of loan where we have a potential arbitrage. I call these your arbitrage loans. This is non-direct recognition in the whole life space or a participating index loan in the IUL space. If we have the opportunity to earn arbitrage, we're not gonna do any withdrawals. We're gonna actually borrow immediately when we get into retirement to supplement our retirement. Now, you don't have to borrow, but if this is the plan, if you need, if the plan is to access the cash value in your policies to help supplement your retirement income, we're just gonna borrow at the beginning and get the arbitrage. That means we're gonna borrow at a lower rate than we get a credit for. So we might borrow at 5%, get a credit of 6%, 7%, 8%, whatever might be available. That's your participating index loans in the IUL and potentially a non-direct recognition type loan in the whole life space. Now in whole life, you, you don't get the choice of a wash loan or a participating index loan or what we call direct recognition loan or non-direct rec recognition loan. It's either one or the other. So depending on your carrier and what type of loan options they have, you're gonna to wanna to know which type it is and if you can get arbitrage. Now there is a possibility that even with indirect recognition, that if we're using an outside lender for collateral, we could get arbitrage. Not in today's interest rate environment, but a few years ago, it was possible. 
we could get some pretty good arbitrage between the cost to borrow and the dividends that we're getting from our whole life policies. So that environment might come back and we might have an opportunity for arbitrage. Now in retirement, it's really only those first few years that we're going to actually withdraw the basis. So after that, we don't have a choice. Once we've withdrawn the basis, now we're just gonna be stuck with the non-direct or the direct recognition loans. So if you have the opportunity for arbitrage and you have a non-direct recognition loan, you'll likely just borrow at the beginning of retirement instead of doing a withdrawal first. You can always withdraw your basis later and switch it over when the arbitrage opportunity goes away. So we can just transfer some of that loan into a withdrawal. The participating index loans of the index universal life policy, we're gonna want to use that in the early years of retirement if positive arbitrage is likely or guaranteed. Now in the IUL, it's not really ever guaranteed. It could be, it could be. It depends on where the fixed interest rates are at and if you can use that as part of your index options. But basically, you're gonna look at the history that you've owned your policy and how it's performed. And if we know we can borrow at 5% and it's historically performed for the last 20 or 30 years and you've gotten six, seven, eight, nine. 10%, whatever the case may be. If it's more than 5%, we're gonna assume that we're gonna be able to continue getting that. And so we are gonna pay 5% for the participating index loan rate. If we can't earn that much, if we're earning less than 5%, or for some reason, the environment changed, the economic environment changed, and we don't expect to be able to earn more than 5%, let's just do a wash loan in the, in the beginning and, and withdraw up to our basis first. That's okay if we don't expect the economic environment to provide us with that positive arbitrage. Now at some point in retirement, even if we start off with a participating index loan, we're going to want to switch to wash loans. Like we said, if the arbitrage isn't likely or if the cash value is too low and we can't risk not getting an offsetting credit. So what that means is let's say we're 20 years into retirement, we've got $2 million in life insurance loans, and our cash value is $300,000. Well, the loan interest on a $2 million loan at 5% is $100,000. Well, if we can get greater than 5% credit, no big deal. But we don't know what the index is going to do from year to year. So are we okay with having that $300,000 drop to $200,000? if we don't get any credit that year. I don't think I would be. And if you're working with me, we're gonna be looking at those things. So those are the things that you'll wanna talk about with your agent. You know, what's a good time to switch from a participating index loan to a wash loan? What's a good way to plan for these kinds of things? And I have videos where I've talked about these things in depth and the risks associated with the different types of loans. But basically, the reason we own these products and we're using them to help supplement our retirement is to make things safer. So we don't really want to be taking on too much risk when our cash value gets too low and we can't really absorb no credit on any given year. So later in retirement, we switch from participating index loans to wash loans to reduce the risk that we're not gonna get an offsetting credit and we can continue to use these until we pass away. Now the overloan protection rider. These can generally be triggered after age 75. There is at least one company that offers age 65 that you could potentially trigger it. Now, I don't expect that me or my clients are gonna use the overloan protection rider. It's like a pull the ripcord emergency type of maneuver where we've borrowed too much and the loan is unsustainable without either paying back some of the loans or having to pay the loan interest. Well, if we're deep into retirement and we don't have an income, we're not going to be able to just absorb not getting any credit in a given year if our cash value is too low and that risk just gets too high. So there could be a situation where you're relying on these policy loans to live and you've somehow borrowed too much out of it. And it doesn't matter if it's whole life or IUL. If you've borrowed too much out of it because of a bad plan, credits were reduced, for whatever reason, you may find yourself in a situation where you ran out of cash value and your policy is at risk of lapse. Well, if you have an overloan protection rider, you trigger the overloan protection rider and you 
effectively walk away from the policy. The insurance company is going to guarantee that you have a death benefit until you pass away and no more money can be put into the policy. You can't add new money to the policy. You can't take any more money out, but you can pay back some of the loans. I don't know why you would want to do that, but they will let you pay back some of the loans. But you trigger the overloan protection rider and a small death benefit will be maintained so that your policy doesn't lapse and you're not going to get a bill from the IRS. The worst thing that can happen is you get that tax bill on top of not having the income that you thought you needed each year in order to survive. So that's just adding to the potential hurt in that scenario. So let's be careful with our policies. Make sure that we don't lapse them. Otherwise, there's going to be some big problems and nobody's going to be happy about that. Now let's take a look at why we borrow rather than just withdraw. This is a hypothetical scenario. We're going to assume that you have 100,000 basis inside of a policy. It means you've paid into it in premiums, 100,000, and you're going to try to take out 30,000 a year in income. Okay, we're going to supplement our retirement at 30,000 a year. Well, if you retire at 65, we're going to pull out 30,000 a year that we need to live on. We're going to be able to do that for three years and then 10,000 the next year. And that satisfies our basis. There's no tax owed on that. There's no loan cost. Okay. And that's the idea. We're just going to borrow that out. We don't have an opportunity for arbitrage in here. We just want to efficiently get our money out of the policy and use it to supplement our retirement. Well, in that fourth year, we've got a $20,000 loan to supplement that. So let's assume we're in a 22% tax bracket. In that 22% tax bracket, if we had just withdrawn that money, we're going to pay 4,400 in taxes. That doesn't sound very appealing. Well, what happens if we're using a wash loan and let's say that there's a net 1% cost. That means we're going to get an offsetting credit, but it might not quite cover the cost to borrow and or the actual cost of insurance inside the policy just doesn't quite make up for it. And so we end up with a net cost. So at a 1% net cost, if we borrow instead of withdrawal, we're going to save that 4,400 tax that year. And the impact of that, that 1% net cost means it's going to take 22 years or age 90 before it would have been more efficient to pay the tax at age 68. Because that's 1% per year. So if it's a 22% tax bracket, it takes 22 years to equal the 22% that we would have paid in taxes that year. Well, that's just for that year. What about the money we borrow the next year? Well, the money we borrow the next year, it takes until age 91, where it would have been more efficient had we just withdrawn it way back when. But had we just withdrawn it back then, we would have had to come up with an additional $6,600. Doesn't make a lot of sense, does it? So... Not only are we saving on taxes right now, but based on life expectancy, it's a pretty slim chance that you're going to live longer than 90 or 91. Well, each year that we borrow, it pushes it out even farther. So if we borrow the money we borrow at age 75, we've got to make it after age 97 to where it would have been more efficient to just do a, a withdrawal at age 75. So very low likelihood in these scenarios that we're going to live long enough that it would have been more efficient to just do a withdrawal and pay the taxes. Now, who knows what the tax brackets are going to be in the future? Let's say the tax bracket was 35%. Well, now at age 68, it's not until age 103 before it would have been more efficient to just do a withdrawal. Well, what if your income, what if you have no income and you're at like the lowest tax bracket? Okay, it's a 10 10% tax bracket right now. Could go up, could go down, who knows. But let's say it's a 10% tax bracket. Now you got till age 78. Tax bill's 2,000 bucks that first year. Well, if you don't, if you expect to live a long time, maybe you do do some withdrawals at the beginning of this. But at some point, it's gonna make more sense to do a loan, save on the taxes, and push the impact of that down to a time where you're probably gonna be dead anyways. <laughs> and not that we want to die, but if an accident happens in these early years, we were definitely better off to borrow as opposed to doing a withdrawal. So hopefully that makes sense and you've got a better understanding of how to utilize policy loans before retirement 
and after retirement. If you have any questions, leave them in the comment section below. I try to answer every question that's there. You can always schedule a meeting with me if you need a one-on-one -on -one consultation, if you wanna talk specifics, especially if you're one of my clients and you need more detailed information on this, definitely get in touch with me. You don't need to try to wing it, but I do offer consultations, paid and unpaid as well. If, if you work with a different agent and you just like some of my time, I do make that available. So everybody gets a 20 minute free consultation. And if you wanna consult longer than that, and we're not talking about you know a product that I might be able to make some type of compensation on, then it's a good idea to do a paid consultation in that scenario. So utilize that free consultation and I hope to talk to you soon. I hope you found value in today's video. If you'd like to find out more about IUL and the whole life, check out these videos right over here and we'll see you next time. Now go maximize your cash flow.